Welcome to the International Broadcast Ministry of Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. Here at Touching Lives, our mission is to touch the lives of the lost and enrich the faith of the found. And now, here is pastor, author, and speaker, Dr. James Merritt. A few years ago, the Barna Research Group conducted a poll that found that spiritual doubt is much more common among Christians than we might have considered. About 65% of Christians said they had questioned what they believed about religion and about God. Now that didn't discourage me, but here's what did discourage me. 45% left the church because of their doubt. They finally came to the conclusion that the evidence for their doubt was greater than the evidence for their faith, and so they just checked out with their doubt. Now, in a way, that's kind of good news for all of us because at our church, I want to tell you, we do not want people to check their doubts at the door. I don't want you to pretend that you don't doubt. I want to be a church that welcomes doubters. That's who we're after. That's who I'm looking for. And if you're doubting some aspect of your faith this morning, just look around where your people around you, where you're sitting, because two out of three people are just like you. Matter of fact, I want to be very transparent and tell you something that may kind of surprise some of you. I don't want you to raise your hand when I ask these questions. Just pretend you are. So don't raise your hand, but have you ever doubted that there's even a God? Because I have. Have you ever doubted that this book is unlike any other book, that it really is the Word of God and the Word from God. Have you ever doubted that? I went through a time in my college life, a crisis of faith that I hope I never go through again, and I finally became convinced there's nothing to this book. Have you ever doubted that God's good? I see the same world you see. Innocent babies get killed. Drunk drivers kill teenagers. I see it just like you do, but yet, we say we believe God is good. You ever doubted it? I have. You ever doubt that God answers prayer? You ever prayed for something over and over and over, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and nothing happened? I have. I've wondered, are you even listening? Is there even a God up there to hear me? You ever doubted that there's anything after this life? Have you ever doubted this place called heaven? Well, if you have, get in line, because so have I. And that may surprise you, and I hope it doesn't, because to be honest, there are some people that think, and they're wrong, that faith eliminates all doubt. As a matter of fact, that is simply not true. Let me just tell you something I bet you've never heard. Faith presupposes doubt. If there's no room for doubt, there's really no place for faith. As the German novelist Hermann Hesse once said, Faith and doubt go hand in hand. They are complementary. One who never doubts will never truly believe. Now, that may sound counterintuitive, but it really is true. That's why we're starting a series today that we're calling I Doubt It. And this series is both for believers and unbelievers. It's for those people who believe in spite of their doubts, and it's for those who don't believe because of their doubts. They just can't get there. And I've got news for both groups. If you've got doubts, I'm glad you've joined the rest of us because even the strongest believers in the Bible had doubts. Do you know what Adam and Eve, Abraham, Moses, David, Elijah, and that John the Baptist had in common? They were all doubters. Listen, Jesus' own brothers and sisters thought he was a whack job. They thought he was nuts. They thought he was crazy. They thought he needed to go see a psychiatrist. The Bible is full of people who doubted. And I got news for you that you probably don't even know unless you're on a secret. Go back and study church history. The church has always been afflicted with this virus called doubt ever since it got started. There's an entire book in the Bible, five chapters. First John was written for one reason, for doubters. Lee Strobel, you may have heard of Lee Strobel. He was a former atheist, and he put doubt, he one time even doubted the existence of God. He put it this way, boy, this is so good. Listen to what he said. 
We could divide Christians into three groups. The first would consist of those who have doubted. The second would be those who haven't doubted yet, but who will. The third group would be for those who are brain dead. Now, you're one of those people that want to be high and mighty, say, well, I've never doubted. Live long enough. Pray long enough. Hang around long enough. You will. It's a part of faith. I'll say it again. If there's no room for doubt, there's no place for faith. Now, I know what some people would say. Somebody would walk up to me right now and say, oh, wait a minute, time out. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. I agree with that. But I would add one other statement. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But without doubt, it's impossible to have true faith. True faith presupposes doubt. Now, I want you to understand. When I talk about doubt, I'm not talking about unbelief. Those are two different things. So what is the difference? Doubt asks questions where unbelief won't even listen to answers. So there's a difference between what I call uncertainty and what I call unbelief. So I want you to take your Bibles right now, and I want you to turn to the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and I want you to turn to the 20th chapter of John. We're going to study a man today who, as a matter of fact, had such a problem with doubt, we've even got a nickname for him. We still use it today. How many of you know what that nickname is? Doubting Thomas. Man in the Bible, so famous for his doubt. And by the way, we're just calling him DT for short, okay? John chapter 20. Now, let me just say this about Thomas right, right quick. I feel sorry for DT, and I'll tell you why. He gets a bad rap. I've heard preachers just rip John Thomas one way upside down. Shame on John. He doubted Jesus. He doubted the risen. Shame on John. Wait a minute. Time out. At least Thomas can illustrate for us and teaches us how to deal with doubt. As a matter of fact, Thomas illustrates this truth. This is my sermon in a sentence, okay? Here's what we're going to learn from Thomas. Without doubt, faith is out. Without doubt, faith is out. So if you're one of those people right now and you'd say, and listen, I know we've got people like this. Man, I would never anybody want anybody to know that I, I'm having doubts. I, 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 I sing on the praise team. I play in a band. I lead a small group. I take care of babies in the nursery. I help park cars. I hold doors open. I, I greet people. I work with teenagers. I don't want anybody to know that I've got a doubt. Shame on you. I want to know. We want to know. And God already knows that what we're going to learn today, and this is going to really be great for some of you. If you're struggling with doubt in your life right now, something about God, something about your relationship with God, what Thomas is going to show us is the steps you take on how to handle a bout with doubt. Because what Thomas was able to do, and you can do, he was able to starve his doubt. He was able to feed his faith. So I would encourage you to write down these five steps I'm going to give you because if you don't doubt, if you're not struggling with doubt now, one day you will, one day your children will, one day your grandchildren will, and you'll be able to help them with their doubts. So five quick steps. We're going to go fast. Number one, if you're a doubter, first thing you need to do is identify the cause. Identify the cause. So you're a doubter, okay? First thing I would ask, if you came to me and you said, boy, I'm really struggling with my faith. I don't believe God loves me. I don't believe God cares. I don't believe this. I don't believe that. My first question I would ask you is this. So why are you doubting? Got to be a reason. What is the cause of your doubt? Now watch, we're filled in. We know why Thomas doubted. Here's why. A week before what we're about to read happened, Jesus had physically appeared to the other disciples. So we read this beginning in verse 20, or verse 19 of John 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, that is Sunday night, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord again. Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, here's what happened. The disciples saw Jesus. They heard Jesus. They talked to Jesus. They experienced Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. You say, well, okay, well, why did Thomas doubt? Well, keep reading. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Now we know why he doubted. 
And for those of you watching online, listen carefully. You know why he doubted? <laughs> he didn't go to church that Sunday. <laughs> he missed church. Everybody else was there. All the other disciples, I don't know what he was doing. By the way, that phrase, one of the 12, that phrase is only used one other time in the, in the, in the Gospel of John. And it's used, it's used in the Gospel of John in connection with Judas. Now, everybody, you know why Judas wasn't there, right? Okay, he was hanging around somewhere else, okay? That's a joke. Go read your Bible. You'll get it, all right? He, he had something else going, but the point is this. Judas couldn't come, but Thomas didn't come. And by the way, while we're in the neighborhood, Jesus said, where two or more gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Let me tell you what that means. Every time you miss church, you miss Jesus. Every time you miss church, you miss a meeting with Jesus. Every time you miss church, you miss a word from Jesus. Every time you miss church, you miss a family reunion with Jesus. But at least now we know one reason why Thomas doubted. He hadn't seen what the other disciples had seen. He hadn't heard what the other disciples had heard. He had not experienced what the other disciples had experienced. Here's all Thomas knew at this point. I spent three years of my life with a guy that told me, I'm the Messiah, I'm the Son of God, I am God, and all I know is he got himself crucified and I hadn't seen him since. That's all I know. Well, he's being honest. And so here's his attitude, and you really can't blame him, right? Shame me once, shame on you, shame me twice, shame on me. So if you're doubting, and let me just be honest with you, at least identify the cause of your doubt. You know why some of you are doubting? Because you, you had an unexpected tragedy come into your life, and you asked God to take care of it, do what you wanted him to do, and he didn't do it. So you doubt his goodness. And then there are some of you, and you prayed for something over and over and over, but God didn't answer the prayer the way you wanted him to answer the prayer, so you doubt God's power. And then there's some of you, and you've dotted every I, and you've crossed every T, and you've kept your life clean and pure, and you've lived by the rules, and you still got it stuck to you. You still lost the job. Somebody still took advantage of you, so you doubt God's justice. And all I'm simply saying to you right now, whether you're watching online or in this building, if you're struggling with doubts right now, at least do this. Ask the question, why am I doubting? Identify the cause. What's caused my doubt, because here's what you're going to find over the next nine or 10 weeks. You're going to find either the reason that you're doubting is really not a good reason to doubt, or you're going to find, well, it may, you may have a good reason, but there's also a really good answer. So you're a doubter. At least be honest with yourself and identify the cause. Why am I doubting? Then you take step two. After you identify the cause, you specify the problem. Now, if you're, you're, you're one of those people who sit silently in the dark room of doubt, and you're too ashamed to let anybody know it, please don't be. If you're one of those people and you're afraid, man, I would never want my pastor to know I doubt, I doubt even God exists. I would never want my pastor to know I sometimes doubt the Bible. I would never want my pastor to know that I doubt God is good or God is loving or God is kind. I, I would never want my pastor to know that. Please don't have that attitude. Please don't do that. You, you, you should not, don't listen. Too many believers have written four words across their struggles with doubt and faith. Don't ask, don't tell. You know, I don't want anybody to know. I want to put on this big front. I want to come to church and act like I've got my spiritual act together. I don't want anybody to know. But I wonder, is there this or is this true or is this right or whatever? So listen, I want to tell you two things about your doubt. Make put you at ease. Number one, the church ought to be a place where doubts go to die. I, I want doubters. I, I really do. Uh, Mike uh, Daniels, my executive pastor, is a chaplain for the Gwinnett County Police Department. He called me yesterday and told me about a conversation he had with one of the police officers there. And this police officer, he's an atheist. When he asked this police officer, why are you an atheist? Classic answer. I just can't believe in a God that would allow innocent people. Do you know, realize what I see as a police officer all the time? And I see all these terrible things happen. I just can't believe in a God that would let all of these bad things happen. I just can't believe there's a God that says he loves the world, but I can't believe he loves the world because if he loved the world, all these things wouldn't go on. And guess what? I'm going to be dealing with every one of those doubts and more in this series that's coming up. But the point I'm making is 
The church ought to be a place where doubts go to die. And I'm hoping that this officer will come. The second thing is, here's the good news. You will never bring a doubt to God that God can't answer. Have you ever thought about this? There's three words that God's never said in eternity past and never will say in eternity present. Three words. I don't know. God's never said that and he never will. You can't bring any question to God. And he goes, I never thought about that. Really? Wow. Let me go. I got to go to the library. No, you can't bring a doubt to God that God cannot answer. So I want to give DT some credit. Everybody believes it. If you walked into that room and you said, okay, how many of you believe that Jesus is alive? How many of you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Give DT some credit. He's the one guy that kept his hand in his pocket. Or if you'd have said, okay, is there anybody here that doubts Jesus? He'd have raised his hand. Yeah, I doubt it. Now, I'm not a believer. Yeah, don't count me in. I, I, you know, and he was willing at least to say, not so fast, my friends. So, verse 25, the other disciples told him, but we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side. Now watch what he said. I will not believe. This is kind of <laughs> funny. Do you realize what an insult he had just given to those 10 guys? He said, you know, I know we spent three years together and I, I know we become best friends just because you believe it doesn't mean I believe it. And again, I want to give DT some credit because I can tell you right now, you ask any attorney, any attorney would be thrilled to have 10 witnesses on his side, any attorney. But Thomas said, hey, I don't care what you've seen. I don't care what you've heard. I'm not taking anybody's word for anything. And here's why I want to give DT credit. Look how honest he was because you know what? There's a lot of skeptics out there. They're not honest doubters. There are a lot of critics out there. They're not honest doubters because listen to what Thomas said. He was being honest. He said four words. I will not believe. Now that's huge. You say, why? Well, it'd been one thing if he had said, I can't believe. He didn't say that. He didn't say, I can't believe. He said, I won't believe. Now, there's a big difference between those two things. You say, well, what's the difference? If you walk up to me and you say, uh, Hey, I've got some doubts. Okay, let's deal with them. No, don't bother. I can't believe. You're being a dishonest doubter because you can. Now, if you walk up to me and say, well, I won't believe, at least you're being an honest doubter because listen to what Thomas said. He said, I will not believe unless. Now, when anybody says unless, I can work with that person because what he was saying was, I'm not, I, I won't believe unless I'm confronted with the facts that make me realize that I ought to change my mind. Now, that's being honest. Dishonest doubt is when you say this. I don't care what the evidence says. I will not believe. You know, the old saying goes, convince a man against his will, he'll be of, of the same opinion still. And I, let me tell you something. I love dealing with doubters. I've told Mike, man, I said, I hope I get a chance to meet with this officer. And, and I'll be honest with you. I would, if I could, don't take this the wrong way. I'd like to spend most of my days not with believers. I'd like to spend most of my days with unbelievers. I, I love to engage with atheists and agnostics and skeptics and people of other faiths. I, I just do. It's just a, it's a passion. It's a gift. And I really do. But I'll tell you what I have learned in my ministry. I will spend all the time that I can with an honest doubter. I won't waste a second with a dishonest doubter. I can't believe I can work with that. I won't believe, don't waste my time. I'll give you an illustration. I heard a story the other day about a man who was absolutely convinced he was dead. I mean, he was absolutely convinced he was dead. So he goes to see a psychiatrist and he walks in. The psychiatrist says, what's your problem? He said, uh, I, I, I'm dead. He said, what do you mean you're dead? He said, I'm dead. No, you're not dead. He said, yeah, I'm dead. He said, man, you got to quit believing you're dead. He said, well, how do I do that? And so the psychiatrist said, uh, repeat, I want you to repeat four words after me. Dead men don't bleed. So he said, okay, dead men don't bleed. He said, say it again, dead men don't bleed. Say it again, dead men don't bleed. He said, okay, I want you to go home. He said, I want you to repeat that 12 times a day, once an hour, 12 hours, 12 times a day. Two weeks, don't come back. Then after two weeks, come back and see me. So two weeks went by, and the man came back to the appointment, and he walked in. 
Psychiatrist said, okay, what do you have to say? He said, dead men don't bleed. He said, say it again. He said, dead men don't bleed. He said, say it a third time, dead men don't bleed. He said, okay, I got a question for you. He said, uh, do you understand it? He said, I do. He said, okay, great. The man took out a needle, the psychiatrist took out a needle and pricked that man's finger and blood starts dripping out of his finger. <laughs> the man looked at his finger and looked back at him and said, well, what do you know? <laughs> what do you know? Dead men bleed. <laughs> now, there's a difference. You liked that, didn't you, honey? There, there's a difference. There's a di if Teresa laughs, I'm in good shape. If, there's a difference between saying, I can't believe and I won't believe. This man, he was a dishonest doubter. He said, I don't care if I'm bleeding, I'm still dead. And I'm simply saying to you, there's a difference between can't believe and won't believe. Now, here's what I love about Jesus. Don't miss the way that Jesus handled Thomas's doubt. He didn't rebuke him. He didn't shame him. He didn't attack him. I mean, Jesus would have been well within his rights to say, you moron, you idiot. For goodness sakes, Thomas, you spent three years with me. You saw me walk on water. You saw me feed thousands of, with few loaves and a few fish. You saw me raise a guy from the dead for Pete's sake. He didn't do that. He did not do that at all. Jesus appreciated an honest question. He thought it deserved an honest answer. So one week later, this happens. Watch this. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them, and he said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, and I guarantee you the disciples went, uh-oh, here it comes. But what does it say to Thomas? Listen to this. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now, we're going to come back to this in just a moment, but I just want you to understand God is big enough to handle any question you want to ask. And God is big enough to handle any doubt that you might be struggling with, and he is not offended by your doubts. Let me tell you what, what, what offends God. It's when you try to lie to him. That offends God. When you're not honest with God, that's what offends God. And I'm telling you, God would rather you be honest with him and communicate a real doubt <clears throat> than to try to live a lie and confess a phony faith. So whatever problem you're having right now that you, that's causing your doubt, specify it. All right, so what is step one? Identify the cause. Why am I doubting? Specify the problem, all right? We see that. He's done that. All right, now what's the third step? Certify the facts. Certify the facts. Doubt is a feeling. Doubt's a feeling. What do you do with feelings? There's only one thing you can do with a feeling. Confront, the, confront it with facts, right? We talked about that last week. Confront it with facts. Somebody said it this way. When does doubt become unbelief? Answer, when you let it. When you let it. If you don't certify the facts, you just said, okay, I'm just going to let my doubt be unbelief because the only way you can ever justify whether a doubt is real and should be or not is you've got to certify the facts. So Thomas was taking the right step. He said, hey, before I believe, I want to see the hands. Show me your hands. I want to put my finger into the side. I want, I've got to touch it. I've got to feel it. I've got to experience it or I'm not going to believe. In other words, give Thomas credit, DT credit. I'm going to investigate. I, I'm going to do my homework. So this is something I said just a while ago. If you're an, an honest doubter, here's what you say. You know, I'm doubting whether something is true or not. I'm doubting whether God exists. I'm doubting whether the Bible is the word of God or not. I'm doubting whether God is good. I'm doubting whether God loves me. I'm doubting whether Jesus is the only way to heaven or not. But I'm willing to investigate the facts to see if my doubt should be justified. Now, if you're a dishonest doubter, here's what you're going to say. My mind's made up. Don't confuse me with the facts. I don't care what you say. I will not Believe, honest doubt ignores the facts. Uh, honest doubt never ignores the facts. It stubbornly pursues the truth. And oh, by the way, let me tell you something else I love about DT. He looked at those 10 men and he said, you know, men, I appreciate the fact that you have faith. But your faith won't cut it for my faith. I got to have my own. And there's something some of you need to hear right now. Your faith better be your faith. 
Not your parents' faith, not your pastor's faith, not your brother's faith, not your sister's faith, not your buddy's faith. Your faith better be your faith. I'll give you a great example of what I'm talking about right now. I hope you know after some of you, I've been your pastor, I've been your pastor almost 40 years. And I hope you know, I try by the grace of God and the power of God to be a man of God. And I always try to preach what I believe is the truth of God by the spirit of God. I try, I give my best to do that for you every single week. But I have said this to you before. I will say it again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Don't you ever believe one thing I say just because I say it. I want you to believe what I say because he says it. That's all that matters. At the end of the day, Jack, it doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what I say. At the end of the day, what matters is, so what does he say? Because I want your faith to be your faith. See, I'm not amazed. Here's the thing people don't get. I am not at all amazed that people doubt that there's a God. That doesn't amaze me. I, I don't at all, I'm not at all amazed that people say, this is just another book. It's a book of myths. You can't believe that book. I am not at all amazed that people doubt that God is good or God is love. That doesn't amaze me. I'm not at all amazed that people don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead and he's still graveyard dead. I don't have any, that never ever amazes me. <clears throat> what amazes me is all these people who doubt, but they won't even investigate the facts. They won't even check it out. They won't even see whether or not, maybe if there's something to it. They will not certify the facts. And that's why we give DT credit. Because in the timeline of the story, this seems the same room where Jesus had met with the disciples earlier. Now, eight days have passed, but here's what I love about Thomas. For more than a week, he hung around. He didn't leave the church. He didn't, you know, forsake anything. He said, you know what? I'm going to hang around. I'm going to go back. I'm going to investigate. I'm going to certify the facts. And that's exactly what honest doubt does. It says, I'm going to find the facts. Uncertainty says, if there's a reason I ought to believe, I want to know it. Unbelief says, you believe whatever you want to believe. I'm out of here. Don't bother me. I don't want to hear anything. And by the way, I do need to say this. If you are a Christian, you should Believe simply, but you should not just simply believe. Let me tell you why. Somebody, somewhere, someplace, somehow is going to challenge your faith. They're going to challenge what you say you believe. And when they do, it won't be enough to tell them what you believe. You better know why you believe it. You better know your stuff. You better have done your homework. Because when you identify the cause and you specify the problem, then you certify the facts without even realizing it. You know what you're doing? You're strengthening your case for faith and you're weakening the case for doubt. Then you can take the next step to realize the benefit of the doubt. You identify the cause, you specify the problem, you certify the facts, and then step four, you ratify the evidence. You ratify the evidence. Now watch this. I hope you get this. I worked on this for weeks. When you take a question mark and you straighten it out, you know what you have left? An exclamation point. Now wasn't that good? I worked on that for, come on, give me some love here. If you take a, if you take a question mark, and you straighten it out, you got an explanation point. That's what happens. Doubt is the question mark. Faith is the exclamation point. So, after Thomas had certified the facts, he ratified the evidence. So watch what Jesus does. He says, okay, Thomas, you want me to put up or shut up? I'll put up. Verse 27. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Now, let me stop here. Let's be honest with each other. Do you know one of the reasons why a lot of people won't confront their doubts? They won't take these steps. You know why they won't? Because deep down, they're afraid maybe their doubts are true. Maybe their doubts are justified. 
Maybe their doubts are right. Maybe what you believed all these time, maybe it's wrong. Maybe there's no foundation to your faith. Well, let me help you out on something. The only faith that God wants you to have and me to have and the only faith that God expects us to have is a faith that is fortified by the facts. And there is not a doubt that any skeptic or any critic or any questioner can ever come up with that God hasn't already thought about and that God cannot Address. In other words, no, you don't have to check your brains at the door of Christianity in order to become a follower of Jesus. You know, we talked about Lee Strobel just a little bit while ago. You may not know his story. Lee Strobel was an atheist, didn't even believe in God, but he had a problem. When he married his wife, she didn't believe in God either. She was an atheist, but somebody presented the gospel to her and she became a believer. He didn't like it because he didn't sign up for that. He didn't want to be married to a Christian. Hated Christian. In fact, it intensified his hatred for Christianity. So he worked for the Chicago Tribune. He goes to his editor and he said, I want you to allow me to do a series of articles on Christianity. I want to expose what a fallacious religion it is. He said, go out, go for it. He said, probably sell a lot of copies. There was only one problem. When he did his homework, he had to ratify the evidence. He came to the conclusion there's only one rational, reasonable explanation that that tomb was empty, and that's because Jesus came back from the dead. And when he realized that, guess what happened to him? He went from uncertainty to faith. He went from unbelief to belief. He went from being against Jesus to being for Jesus. And he learned Christianity is not a blind faith that believes in spite of the evidence. It is a bolstered faith and a bold faith and a brilliant faith that believes because of the evidence. I want to tell you something. I'm a Christian not in spite of what I know. I'm a Christian because of what I know. And I get more convinced every single day. Take everything else away. You cannot explain that empty tomb. You cannot explain it apart from the physical, literal, visible resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't do it. It's impossible. So our faith is built on a solid foundation. So let me tell you something. You know why I'm not an atheist? I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I, I, I don't have that kind of faith. I just don't have enough faith to believe that there was this big bang and something came out of nothing many years ago and voila, here we are. I, I don't have that faith. I don't have enough faith to believe that my house is where it is today because there was an explosion at a Home Depot and it just came together. I just, I don't have enough faith to believe that. I just don't have enough faith to believe that this Bible is a book of myths and not the Word of God. It takes a whole lot more faith to believe that, to believe that Jesus was just another dude than to believe he was the Son of God. And what I've learned about my faith and what I love it is this, once you identify the cause and once you specify the problem and once you certify the facts and once you ratify the evidence, here's what I've learned. Faith can handle any doubt. Faith has tremendous foundation and you don't have to live in uncertainty all of your life. But now there's one last step you have to take. And so many people don't do it, and that's why they still always stay on shaky ground. Because once you take these four steps, you need to take one last step. You need to testify to the truth. Now, Thomas doesn't even bother touching his hands. He doesn't put his finger into his side. Jesus said, stop doubting and believe. That's all Jesus said. Okay, stop doubting and believe. Now look at his response. This is awesome. Thomas said, my Lord... And my God. See, that's the first thing. Amen. That's the first. I love that lady. That's the first thing. That is the first thing you always do. Once the faith of facts confronts the dilemma of doubt, guess what you do? You confess your faith and you conquer your doubt. Now, look what, look what he said. This is so good. This is so great. He just burst out. He can't help it. My Lord and my God. You don't know what a great statement that was? Listen to what he did. When he said, my Lord, he put Jesus on the throne of his heart. When he said, my God, he put Jesus on the throne of the universe. He said, you are my Lord. He said, you are my God. Now, 
Watch this. This is the best part of this whole thing to me. See, I know what some of you are saying right now. I know some of you, maybe you're watching right now by TV or wherever, and you're a skeptic, and you're a critic, and you're a doubter, and you're saying, wait a minute, Buster. Hold on just a minute. That's easy for him to say. He saw Jesus. He heard Jesus. He talked to Jesus. He could have reached out and touched Jesus. But what about us? Well, you know I love Jesus. He's, Jesus is sharp. He's real sharp. He's perfectly sharp. Jesus knew that was coming. So what's this? He says to Thomas, in effect, Thomas, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. So listen to what his response was. Watch this. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Now watch this. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Question. Who is Jesus talking about then? Who? Us. Us. Yeah, raise your hand back there, sweet lady. I see that hand. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. He's talking about us. Jesus knew what he was doing. He said, hey, Thomas, I'm glad you believe because you saw. That's, that's okay. But Thomas, let me teach you a lesson. Believe he's not seeing. You believe that? If you really believe believing is seeing, let me prove it to you. You ever seen David Copperfield, the magician? Believing ain't, seeing's not believing. Okay, he'll tell you. He can't make a car disappear can't do that. You can't physically impossible. But you believe it because you saw it. No, seeing's not believing. Believing is seeing. And Jesus said, by the way, I know about Anderson and I know about James and I know about Teresa and I know about Chris and I know where you're going to be in 2023 and you've never seen me and you've never heard me, and you've never, you know, talked to me, and you've never, you know, heard me talk to you. You've never touched me, but you believe. You say, why do you believe? Same reason you do. The reason why I believe, and although I've never seen Jesus, there was one time I ate some bad Mexican food. I thought I might have heard from Jesus. Other than that, I've never heard Jesus. I've never reached out and I've never touched Jesus, but I'll tell you what has happened to me. Because of the power of the Word of God and because of the conviction of the Spirit of God and because of the testimony of the people of God like my mom and my dad, I believed. And I want to tell you today, Jesus is more real to me than you are. Jesus is more real to me than the skin on my flesh and the blood in my veins and more real to me than the air that I breathe. Because I don't believe because I see. I see because I believe. And I made up my mind, I'm going to doubt my doubt before I doubt my God. I'm going to doubt my doubt before I doubt my God. So, see, this is what I want to close with. And a lot of people miss this, and this is the most important part of this message. If you really want to conquer your doubts, you've got to testify to the truth. You have got, there, listen, there is a power to testifying to your faith, confessing your faith, verbalizing your faith, speaking your faith, sharing your faith that fortifies your faith. We baptized a sixth grader this morning at 9.15. So excited. You should have heard his testimony. It was awesome. And this is why being baptized is such a big deal. Some people, think, why do you want people to be baptized? Why do you emphasize baptism, Pastor? See, run up the numbers has nothing to do with numbers. See, people get wet, couldn't care less about that. But there's something about baptism and standing up there and professing your faith and telling people you believe in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. There's something about that that strengthens your faith, seals your faith, destroys your doubts. There's something about sharing the gospel with people. There's something about telling people about Jesus. It's testifying to the truth. So you're watching right now. You've got doubts. You're listening right now. You've got doubts. Tell you what you do. You bring your doubts to the word of God. You verbalize your doubts to the Son of God. You confess your doubts to the Spirit of God. And if you're an honest doubter, you will see the benefit of the doubt because here's what will happen, because it happened to me 30 miles from here in a theater as a nine-year-old boy. When you do your homework and you check it out, you will not be able but to help and say, 
my Lord and my God. So would you pray with me today with heads bowed, with eyes closed? You may be watching online right now and you may be a doubter. But maybe you've heard enough in this message. Maybe you're in this room right now. You've heard enough of this message and you would say, Pastor, I believe. I want to become a follower of Jesus. I'm tired of my doubts. It's time to quit. It's time to start doubting my doubts and quit doubting my God. And I want this Jesus to be my Lord and I want this Jesus to be my God. You know what? All you got to do is tell him right now. You're in this room or you're watching right now. You could say right now, Lord, I believe. I believe you're the son of God. I believe you were born of a virgin. I believe you lived a perfect life. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe God raised you from the dead. I believe you're alive right now. And I believe that if I repent of my sins and confess my sins, and ask forgiveness of my sins, you'll save me. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm asking you, Lord Jesus, to become my Lord, my God, my Savior. I'm asking you to forgive me of all my sins. I am taking you at your word that you're giving me and have given me eternal life. And I want to thank you for hearing my prayer. When you turn on the news these days, you quickly realize our world's in serious trouble. People need Jesus like never before. If you're a believer, you've got to work extra hard to stand firm and stay strong in these troubling times. I've heard it said that without action, the best intentions in the world are nothing more than that, intentions. So I want to give you three actionable tools designed to intentionally deepen your faith. Number one, you can enroll in our daily devotion email. Each day we provide you with an encouraging word and targeted prayers to make sure you're ready to face the day. You can sign up at touchinglives.org. Number two, you can download our Touching Lives app where we have a library of sermons and daily inspiration and you can even receive prayer for whatever you're facing. It's available in the app store now on every device. And finally, number three, you can follow Touching Lives on social media, including Instagram and YouTube. This year, we added a boatload of encouraging videos and inspirational quotes that are easy to share with your friends and family. Thank you again for being a part of the TL family. May God bless you richly so that this would be one of your best and most blessed years yet for the glory of God. Touching the lives of the lost and enriching the faith of the found. This is Touching Lives with Dr. James Merritt. This broadcast is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.